Today we are here to discuss a short story by Susan Glassbell, a jury of her peers. Susan Glassbell was born in 1876 in Davenport, Iowa. She grew up there, attended Drake University in Des Moines, and immediately after graduating worked for several years as a reporter at the Des Moines Daily News and other local newspapers. But she discovered early on that her interest was in writing fiction. Uh, she moved to Chicago, did graduate studies at the University of Chicago, and began writing short stories published in magazines, which in those days published a lot of fiction, weekly magazines of one sort or another, and they were immediate hits. Her first novel, The Glory of the Conquered, published in 1909, became a national bestseller and drew a rave review from the New York Times. Although she was uh, widely uh, regarded uh, during her uh, lifetime, widely followed, uh, Glassbell is little read or performed today, with one major exception, a jury of her peers, the story we will be discussing uh, today. Uh, it was uh, published in 1917, uh, based on a play named Trifles, uh, that she had uh, written and produced uh, in Provincetown the year before. Both were in turn based upon a true murder uh, that had taken place at the turn of the century in Des Moines, which she had uh, covered and become very uh, closely interested in uh, as, a, uh, as a young girl. The short story was an immediate hit. Uh, it was highly controversial. Many readers regarded it as highly disturbing in its plot and denouement. Uh, it was anthologized in that year uh, and uh, in many, many years uh, throughout her lifetime. It was rediscovered in the 1970s by the feminist movement, uh, and it has become a staple of women's studies uh, courses in colleges and universities in recent decades. So that's a little background about uh, Susan Glassbell and a jury of her peers. And I'd now like to uh, ask Amy uh, to tell us a little bit about this story. Sure. The plot of the story is deceptively simple. <clears throat> and I'll basically really just rehearse the plot. A farmer, John Wright, has been found by a neighbor, Mr. Hale, <clears throat> strangled in his bed by a rope. His wife, Mrs. Wright, born Minnie Foster, has been arrested and accused of the murder. The story takes place the next day when Sheriff Peters, along with the attorney, the county attorney, Mr. Henderson, the witness, Mr. Hale, and the wives of the sheriff as well as of <clears throat> Mr. Hale, Mrs. Peters and Martha Hale, respectively, visit the Wright House. The men go to seek evidence that might convict the accused, the women to gather things to bring to the accused in jail. The two women, formerly unfamiliar to one another, spend their time downstairs looking at kitchen things and the like, which are dismissed by the men as insignificant or as mere trifles. While the men, the real investigators, search the bedroom upstairs and the barn outside. The men come up empty, not so the women. Much more penetrating in their vision, they piece together the sort of married life that Mrs. Wright must have lived. And from a series of clues, the unfinished work in the kitchen, uh, bad stitching on a quilt she had been sewing, the unhinged door on the canary cage, and finally the corpse of a strangled canary. They reconstruct Mrs. Wright's um, motive. In silent collusion, Mrs. Hales and Mrs. Peters choose not to disclose the clues that would reveal this motive, thus they tacitly constitute themselves as a jury of her peers, and they judge and acquit Mrs. Wright of any wrongdoing. As I said uh, in my introduction, this has become a, a canon of the feminist literature uh, in recent decades. What is it that qualifies this as a particularly uh, feminist uh, statement? I, I 
guess you could see the story as a uh, response to women's exclusion from public life, uh, not not voters, not participating on juries, and the women, women here. Women could not be on juries at, at, at this, this time. time yes. Right. This is the date is 1917. It's before the suffrage amendment and before the the change in jury service. So you could see it as a kind of brief for women's inclusion, broader inclusion in public life. Uh, one thing that interests me about it is that it proceeds not by ar making the argument for women's equality, but really by making an argument for women's superiority. superiority. So it's not just possible to read it as a feminist text, but really as a sort of female chauvinism, uh, that the women really, uh, really put the, put the men to shame. I mean, the men believe that they are superior. They practice uh, really irritating condescension towards the, towards the women. Uh, and yet charge. it's, the, it's right. the women who, right. in their in the quiet, kitchen. modest way, uh, figure all of this out. I, I, I would add to that. The reader is urged, really, to rethink the meaning of victim in this story. Mr. Wright is the one who's been killed. But the real trial seems to be the trial of John Wright and, in particular, of men in general, uh, while Mrs. Wright comes to be seen as a victim. And that has something to do with the condescending ways in which the men speak about what the women do, as not only what they do, but also their stupidity. Who They wouldn't even recognize evidence if they saw it. But it also uh, has to do, and this is a classic feminist move, I suspect. Uh, there's a transformation of the women in the story. Mrs. Hale, whose remorse for never having visited her old friend, Minnie Foster, all the years of her married life, she turns from remorse into activism. She starts um, repairing the quilt the quilting that she had done. While Mrs. Peters, who is, to begin with, seems very, very timid and subservient to her husband, suddenly is transformed by recalling events that happened early in, earlier in her life. The death of her cat, who was uh, axed, and uh, the kind of terrible rage that she had as a result of that. As, as well as the death of her first child when she was on the plains. And of course, the activism is shown in the collusion at the end. They become the judges. They become the ones who acquit. And, and it's, in a way, the entire male sex that is put on trial, right. because the behavior of the men in the story is a somewhat uh, tamped down version of what John Wright has has done to his wife. Exactly. Well, um... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Equal no, we're time. Just, we're yeah. we're no, just look, explaining I, I, why, it's, uh, why it's regarded. No, no, I, I, I understand. I, I, I think, look, um, the gender differences are obviously very important to the story, and um, even if you didn't know the author's uh, feminist history, uh, you could tell that the gender differences are very important to the author, at least as displayed in the story. This is life um, uh, in the rural Great Plains of a hundred years ago. Um, it's an arduous life, it's a farming life, and there are, there's a division of labor of different spheres. The women tend the inside, they tend the kitchen and the hearth, uh, they provide for the dailiness of daily life. And the job of the men is uh, arduously to make a living, and at least through the law, to protect and keep the peace. It's connected with different views of the world. I mean, the women uh, have a much more interior view of things, whereas the men look at the surface. The men look for the evidence, the women see through the evidence to its meaning. I mean, the, um, uh, the, the men are coldly rational, the women attend uh, life through feeling. And uh, 
maybe those are products of, 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 of culture of the time. Maybe they have something to do with differences in men and women. The story shows the inadequacy, never mind, never mind the condescension of the men. The story shows the inadequacy of a merely male-oriented, external, rational understanding of the events of life. The men are supposed to be def making it possible for domestic life to flourish but they can't read the truth of domestic life in the kind of way that makes them understand this particular assault on domestic life. It's only the women who understand what it is that's to be defended that enables them really to see the truth of what's happened. But it's not simply on the basis of their feeling. They see evidence that the men would never even look at. And our attention is drawn over and over again to their discernment and their seeing. No, I, I, but isn't that connected with their empathy? It, it seems to me at every point it's the women's empathy that enables them to see things that the men don't see. So, so that it's, it, their superior cognition is really linked to some kind of emotional intelligence or... Yeah. And that this uh, accords with a kind of traditional reading of differences between the sexes. The difference here is, is though, that the men don't seem to have any respect for what the women do. I mean, you might have a kind of separate spheres um, arrangement where both sides would be, uh, you know, occasionally, uh, well, that's how women are, or that's how men are, uh, sort well, of tolerant of one another's uh, foibles, but still very respectful. And that, that, that seems to me it's, it's, no, it's missing here. I mean, these, these guys really are irritating. I, I grant that they're irritating, but the, partly the question is what, in what tone of voice some of that banter takes place. Mr. Hale, who's responsible for some of the worst things, is, is, uh, is um, uh, well, his, in fact, his wife is, is explicitly known to be his superior because she's afraid when he speaks, um, uh, he's going to wander right. off and he's <laughs> illogical, boy, right. like a little boy pronouncing in school. But, and, but not just that. She says, I, I was worried that he would say something that would make things harder for Minnie Foster. So in other words, that... That's almost her first statement, and she is already biased, or her she, sympathies she, she are be, already with She might be biased, but she also takes his measure. And he sort of good-naturedly makes, makes these, uh, these disparaging remarks, partly, I think, to deal with his discomfort, partly to ingratiate himself with the party of the men. Um, the county attorney makes this, makes this sort of nasty remark and then sort of remembering his manners, uh, thinking like a politician and thinking his future says, yeah. we can't, well, we can't do without, <laughs> the, without ladies, the ladies, but that's not an appeal for the women's vote because the women don't vote which means that it's a world in which you have to be careful how you speak about the ladies because the men, or because the women will somehow influence how the men will behave. But, so, but the effect of these speeches on the women uh, is actually to make them resentful. And the effect of, of, of these speeches from the men, I mean, it reaches a kind of culmination on page 288. There was a laugh for the ways of women. Uh, and then the county attorney said briskly, well, let's go right out to the bar and get that cleared up. I don't see as there's anything so strange, Mrs. Hale said resentfully. Yep. Uh, and it seems to me it's right after that moment it reaches this kind of crescendo for her that she takes her first step, her first step to actually uh, alter the evidence and hide the evidence, her first step towards the obstruction of justice. Uh, I, she's, she's lost all respect for the world why, of man's justice. Say, it's not just sympathy, but also cognition. The last comments and the overall picture I agree with. But, I mean, let me just say that it, if you're a lawman and you're coming in to investigate a murder and you've got people standing in the kitchen talking about the broken jars of preserved fruit um, or worrying about the quilts, um, it's going to strike you as you're dealing with small things when the large thing is finding out who did it and enforcing the law. That, I mean, to, to, to use the word trifles is insulting, but there is a certain way. It's really strange. Here she's on trial for murder, and she's worrying about her preserves. That's odd. It's, at least it's odd to me. But if she's the one who's on trial for murder, you as a law enforcer or uh, someone who is investigating the crime should be interested in learning as much as you can about what she's been doing. A ab no, abs absolutely right.
I mean, the, the men are obtuse. They're, uh, they, they don't see very well. Um, but um, there is at least, if you simply set it up in this kind of uh, stark way and, and you sort of dismiss the perspective of the men, uh, you lose in a way the opportunity to really think as a puzzle who has um, which sort of orientation is closest to doing the work of, of, of justice and judging and enforcing the law. Let me say a word about <clears throat> The other man, the man who's not there because he was murdered the night before, John Wright. Uh, John Wright is not simply a man who has the hard life of a farmer and providing for a home. Right. He's clearly a terrible husband. He's cold. Uh, he has no sympathy for his wife. I think we're not supposed to think it is simply the perspective of Martha Hale, Mrs. Hale, uh, but the truth of the matter, that he did, in a sense, kill Minnie. She used to be a singer. She used to be a happy person. And uh, she, she was clearly on the brink of a nervous breakdown. Uh, at the time, her canary was strangled. She had this one little piece of happiness in her life, and something happened, and he came in, and he wrung the canary's neck, he killed the canary. Um, and we have Martha saying out loud and to herself toward the end of the story that Minnie had been, the Minnie that she knew, the old Minnie Foster, had been killed, she had been killed. So in a sense, Minnie was killed, the canary was killed uh, before, uh, Mr., uh, before Mr. Wright uh, 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 was killed. So I'm not saying it, it justified what transpired, but it is, uh, it is an element of the acquisition of sympathy uh, for many. There's another point that really does not fit the, uh, the feminist story here, uh, which is one of, I found one of the most powerful ones, <clears throat> which is that Mrs. Hale uh, as this evidence becomes clearer and clearer, comes to blame herself. She actually says, I am the, I am the one who was guilty. The crime was mine. She uses those terms. For 20 years, she'd been living just down the road. She knew many as a, they'd been friends when they were girls. She knew that she had a hard life. Many did. They had no children. Her husband was hardworking, but a fairly rough and cold man, she never came over once. The first time she set foot in the house was the day after Minnie had been arrested for murder. And she blames herself more and more and more for not having been a good neighbor. And, I, and at the end, it's not just, in my view, sympathy for Minnie, but guilt about her own uh, nonfeasance her own lack of friendship uh, toward her neighbor uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, accounts for her decision. Mrs. Peters is a different matter. No, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but I think that is not incompatible with the feminist reading of the story. I would add to that. I, I think the solidarity element is strong there. Mm -hmm. In other words, she had been, uh, part of what she's guilty of is, is failing in this solidarity with other women, and she is now going to rectify that. And she does it partly through the alliance that she strikes up with Mrs. Peters, mm -hmm. uh, an alliance that really transforms uh, Mrs. Peters. You know, uh, I, I like that, um, but I'm not sure you need to elevate this into um, a large uh, sort of social commentary on uh, the state of women generally. I mean, the reason, the, the reason that she didn't visit the house was that it was a cheerless place. Um, she let, she says, uh, and she let Minnie Foster die for lack of life. I mean, it, that was, there was no life in the house, in fact, and so she let the spirit of Minnie Foster die. And she comes, I think, to see, and both of the women comes to see, as, as Chris, I think, has indicated, that in a certain way, um, the killing of Mr. Wright is the taking of revenge for 
the strangling of the canary, which is symbolically the killing of Minnie Foster. Mrs. Wright, Mrs. Hale always calls her Minnie Foster. Foster. She never calls her Mrs. Wright. So that they somehow see this as um, they identify with her. Um, they, but they don't somehow say the plight of all women is the plight of, uh, of, of Minnie Foster. Um, they, they see that they have somehow failed as neighbors. They understand that crime has been committed here, and they become, as it were, they defend the avenging angel of, 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 of Minnie Foster and, and become, her, become, in a way, her, her, her defenders. Let me get right to the heart of things by uh, asking uh, uh, each of you uh, whether you believe that their decision to withhold evidence, that is, the canary with the wrung neck, which itself was a crime, that makes one an accessory after the fact to murder. Right. Do we approve of their decision or do we disapprove of it? Were they right to do it? Leon. Um, mainly, no, I don't approve of it. Um, I think uh, as, a, as a citizen, I deplore it. I mean, I think uh, um, whatever your feelings of sympathy might be for the accused, uh, the law requires that at least with respect to the investigation, we disclose what happened, and if one wants to uh, plead for mercy on the basis of sympathy, one could do it at the trial, or one can do it at sentencing, or various other times. But um, there's a curious, there's a curious thing. I mean, I said mainly no, and as a citizen, I continue to say no. But it's very curious. the The story is about a jury of her peers, namely Mrs. Wright's peers. But the reader is put also in a position of constituting him or herself part of a jury of the peers of these two women who've withheld evidence. And um, I find myself sympathetic to these women. In other words, you, you read the story, you're able to see the whole crime through their eyes. And you could say, the law is the law, but there's such a thing as either equity or justice, and it's not just female solidarity. They've understood something. They've declared, they found a, a notion of justice in which, Minnie, uh, in, in which Minnie Foster Wright is not guilty. And we're, as, as a jury of their peers, as peers, uh, as a jury of their peers, we are so sympathetic to them that our pr initial presumption uh, that they've done wrong is at least qualified. So, I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm bothered. I mean, I mostly think they did <laughs> wrong. Um, and, uh, but why is it that I'm so sympathetic to what they've done? Because yes. you are both a human being and a citizen. No, I'm saying... <laughs> It's, it's, it's not that I'm a sappy human being who's been uh, softened up by I, decades of feminism. I'm not saying that sympathy it's, is it, sap. Um, it's, it's that they have enabled me to understand the entire crime because they understand the inner meaning of the house. They understand that this is in some ways just. Mr. Wright, in a certain way, got what he deserved. That's what you mean by justice. And there is a sense of justice which is not simply law-abidingness. That's partly, I think, what's... I, what's I, I would agree with that. I would say that as a citizen, they should not have withheld the evidence. But you can't help but feel some kind of sympathy for what, they've, what they're doing. Oh, wait a minute. As you read along. Uh, and also... Uh, can, can I bother you? Just one second. There's one thing that's said about Mr. Wright, in addition to the fact he's reputed to be a good man in town, and he doesn't drink, and he pays his debts. And he doesn't beat her. And, he's a, and he doesn't beat her. But Mrs. Hale says, this is a quote, like, he's like a raw wind that gets to the bone. Now... 
anyone <laughs> with a soul in her body. Look, there are bad been. marriages. There are bad marriages. They're very sad. They don't generally justify your killing your husband. And it's not, it, this has got to be more than sympathy. It's got to be, I didn't say I simply sympathized with these women. Um, they, they're moved by female solidarity in part. I'm not. I'm moved by justice. And I have a sense that... Well, I think they are too. But there is a larger justice that they've achieved here. Is that, is that right? Um, I, I, I guess I, I'm not quite prepared to agree with that. I mean, there is a murder that goes unpunished. Right. They've committed obstruction of justice. Uh, there's also been really kind of a loss of marital trust. I mean, particularly in bringing Mrs. Peters into this. She's married to the law, and now she's uh, going to be engaged in this cover-up for the next uh, next few months. I don't see that they've really done uh, Minnie Wright herself any, any favor. Uh, and it seems to me that the women have proved their own unsuitability for ever serving on a jury or ever being granted the granted the vote and uh, uh, in <laughs> inclusion on juries. Uh, I mean, juries are really at the heart of our justice system. This is an issue central for a self-governing people. And uh, yeah, no, look, I, I. I um, also, with, I mean, with, the ex know, with, with, with the exception of your um, uh, hesitation to put women on juries, I, I agree. They've done something. They've done something wrong, and justice, in, in, the, in the formal sense, certainly has not been served. But the question is, why is it? Why is it that um, people reading this story who are not responding to a feminist argument and who are not responding to female solidarity, nevertheless say, you know what? Um, they've seen something insofar as they've constituted themselves a jury. They may have done justice here. No, they, may, they, was, they may have they, reached because, the right because result. Of, because of the author's brilliance and because there really are extenuating circumstances. But as you yourself said, those should be brought in at a later point in the procedure. So they have short-circuited the procedure. They've really taken it upon themselves to be uh, the detective, the judge, the jury, to be, yeah. you know, God God himself and to mete out this sort of but, divine, let, let, divine let, justice. Let, let me know, just walk for a second between the two of you. I, good. I agree with both of you, uh, there is a subversion of justice, legal justice right. here. But the justice that you're talking about is, the, is different from legal justice, I suspect. Well, and I think there's a certain sense in which um, Mr. Wright gets exactly what he deserves. Yeah, no, but look, that, 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 that can't be the full story. These women only see the women's side. I mean, I take it he has a story, too. He, I mean, yeah, whatever what killed what his soul. What if there were putting together his You know, his, story. yeah, his, 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 his hard soul was deformed at some earlier point in his own life. And, you know, that, that's a kind of omniscience that human beings don't, don't have. And so they, they are partisan, the, the women here are partisan from the beginning. Except and they, if, if they, you, make, they make no attempt to, to understand John Wright. Diana, if you look at it from the point of view of Mrs. Wright, of, of, Mrs. Wright, Minnie. if we, if Minnie Foster, right. if we agree with mm -hmm. what Chris and Leon were suggesting, namely that Minnie Foster has been killed. She's one of the three deaths. It's a kind of metaphorical death, but nevertheless a death. Uh, and she's afterwards, when she's Mrs. Wright, she becomes frenzied. The only time that you see her quiet still is when they come upon her, when Mr. Hale comes upon her in her house and she's sitting in that... Bleeding her apron. Pleading her apron, sitting quite still. She seems to be at rest. She seems to be quite satisfied. She has avenged the death that he committed, or the crime that he committed. 
Are our views at all affected by the portrayal of the criminal justice system itself in the story? This will be a jury of men, and uh, this uh, man who is to be the prosecutor uh, uh, is used to making use of sarcasm. Um, and so it may be that, w that one of the things that's certainly on their mind is that there will be, to some degree, a lack of justice in the proceedings. Right. If they just turn this bird over to the sheriff as we know him and the prosecutor as we know him, uh, they're kind of imagining some kind of a, uh, a circus, a court where the, 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 uh, the conviction is uh, preordained. And a lot of the, a lot of the elements uh, that went into uh, the murder uh, will not be presented to the jury, will not receive a sympathetic hearing. No, I don't know. I don't know about that because we're told that uh, that juries, male juries, tend to be very sympathetic to women. And the county prosecutor says, you know, even though there's all this sort of circumstantial evidence uh, without a motive, oh, I mean, oh, he oh, really oh, is oh, in oh. quest of a motive in right. the same way that the women are. He yeah. just doesn't arrive at it. And, so he says without a motive, and, and he's looking for something dramatic, some, you know, heat of passion kind of moment. And in the, in the uh, so, so he I says, think, I think the is, understanding uh, is that in what the women have done, uh, that this will lead to Minnie's uh, acquittal. acquittal. Okay. I think that uh, we're intended to have a view of the criminal justice system as less than a perfect embodiment of disinterested law, and that this is an additional element that influences them to make their to make the very grave decision. Uh, that they make. Where do you think all of this ought to come into play in a jury trial? Where, what's all of this? Where, 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 where would, where would um, Minnie's motives, the circumstances of her life, uh, the circumstances uh, surrounding the murder of her husband, where would, does, does, does this have no role? Is it just, you know, she did it and that's the end of it? Do we take no account of this in deciding what is to become of Minnie? No, I, I think that the investigation, like all criminal investigations, should really be fact-driven. And the evidence should be turned in. But all the other aspects of the jury, of the trial, uh, the prosecution, the jury's hearing, the judgment, I think those other things could be taken into consideration. I too am inclined to say the place for these considerations really is in the domain of, 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 of sentencing and so on. But, um, and I think uh, one should probably be uh, uh, more rigorous in the prosecution of murders than let's say uh, petty, certain petty crimes. But, wouldn't you think that if you had a man on trial for uh, robbing food from a grocery store, that um, as part of the consideration of guilt or innocence, it would matter uh, and would be appropriate to ask whether or not uh, he did this to feed uh, a house full of, of, of children who had no food? I mean, Jean Valjean. Well, no, I, I, I would stick with this only comes in at the, at at the, the sentencing phase. Yes, or it comes in at the phase of prosecution. In other words, the prosecutor decides what charge is he going to bring? Right. Is he even going to, you know, is he even going you know, to pursue, it, it, pursue this? It, it, right. But but that at the at the at the phase of the jury trial, the jury is charged with the determination of the facts, facts. Uh, and it seems to me all of this talk of empathy is really disintegrative of our of our system. I mean, it's very hard in an age of compassion to speak about empathy, to speak against empathy, because it makes you seem antipathetic. But <laughs> you know, I'd like to I'd like to make the case against em against empathy. But, uh, but, the but, special quality of judges and jurors is impartiality. Lady Justice is always picked as blindfolded. Wow. Why is she blindfolded? Because she doesn't see persons. If she sees persons, she might empathize with some rather than others. Yeah. Uh, and that leads to a skewing well, of, that, 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 of that, justice. I, I, I agree. So yeah. God's justice is omniscient. He takes the blindfold off, but none of these human beings are capable of that. But look, Di Diana, in the best of all possible worlds, justice is blind and we could be impartial. But isn't the reason that jury selection has become such an art? It's because we do 
acknowledge and expect people to bring their own opinions, their own common sense, not specific things. Uh, this crime was done to someone in my house and therefore I'm going to get that person. Not specific yeah, things, I, but in general. I, I would say some of that development has been uh, not, so desi not so desirable either, yeah. Uh, but it, it, it seems to me, yes, uh, impartiality is, is an aspiration. We are not going to attain it, but it's an aspiration that's worth up upholding. And uh, uh, omniscience is not a is not a more easily attained right. standard, and so right. we better stick with impartiality. But, but when the jury when the jury reaches a verdict on the facts, is it is it enough to say yes, Mrs. Wright was the one who put the rope around her husband's neck? Is that all that's under? Is that is all that the jury is supposed to, to oh, say? It would depend on the charge the prosecutor brought. If he brought a charge of first degree murder, then they would have to also determine whether it was premeditated and willful, whether, whether it okay, met the standards yes. of, of first degree murder. Okay. So the, these are judgments not just on the overt external facts, but also really on whatever it is that would meet the standard uh, under which the case is. There are determined. degrees of right. murder. But right. It does seem, seem to me that in this story, uh, it really is a denial of that aspiration of impartiality, and it substitutes another standard, a jury of one's peers. And even though people use this phrase a lot, that phrase is not in the, in the Constitution. Right? And, and it seems to me that a jury of one's peers is proper to a, a, a regime characterized by inequality or a class based regime like England where it originated right. but that in America where we where the premise is equality that uh, we, we shouldn't think so much about a jury of one's peers constituted as you know folks just like you your gender your race your your little neighborhood but uh, instead in terms of uh, impartiality that every citizen ought to aspire to yep. Are these two women uh, actually jurors? Is that a good metaphor? Is the title appropriate? Uh, I think not, for the reasons that I mean, it's a it's a term of art, fits with the story. Uh, but in fact, uh, even if women uh, could have been jurors, then neither of them would have made it onto the jury. One was her neighbor, one was the sheriff's wife, and uh, what the Constitution guarantees is a speedy trial by an impartial jury. Diana's raised some doubts about right. the, the, the wisdom of going this route. Um, I mean, we, we do have, according to the, to the Constitution, the passage uh, that, that you read, it's not just an impartial jury, uh, it's an impartial jury uh, of the state and district where the crime shall have been committed. Um, and uh, I guess the question is, what is the Constitution getting at when it's saying of the state and district? Um, is that a sort of shorthand of for people sort of like you, of people who know the circumstances of your life? Right. And uh, isn't that, I mean, if so, isn't that sort of halfway to saying people who might be at least sufficiently sympathetic to the life in which the crimes have been committed so that they could judge most richly and not simply abstractly according to the letter of some law. I take it that the requirement of common district and community uh, is not so much to produce a sympathetic jury as to produce a jury that will be free of uh, negative prejudices. In other words, it's trying, to, it's trying to weed out people who couldn't possibly understand the world in which this takes place. Not that you would thereby gain neighbors who would be more inclined to be friendly, because presumably both the victim and the accused are from the same community and therefore of equal, of equal standing before the nation. For this kind, Chicago would be too far away, for, for both geographically and in terms of culture and understanding Outlook. of what and, and, and yeah. outlook. I wondered uh, as to the three uh, editors of this book uh, who selected uh, this story to be included in a section about justice, law abidingness and public order in America. Uh, if, if you regard this story as saying we've talked, we've talked about its feminist themes and we've talked about universal themes. 
the nature of, of justice and the practicalities of a criminal justice system. Is there anything about this story that is quintessentially American? Does it tell us something about America or the American character? Or is it just a story on these other things that happen to be plopped into the middle of the author's uh, uh, hometown? It really is a kind of window into America. What I had in mind, um, what came to mind immediately was that very haunting picture at the end of Tocqueville's Democracy in America of the pioneer woman whose life is very difficult and very harsh. Uh, she tries to bring to the frontier all of the little things of civilization but she's basically drained of her life. And one of the things you see very vividly, if you really try to get inside these characters here, is a, you get a picture of what it must have been like to be a woman on the frontier or in the plains when the weather was terrible and canning took all summer and laundry was a big deal. There are no washing machines. You have to get the water. You have to boil the water. It's a whole day, a whole week's affair. So uh, it gave me a kind of um, better understanding and I would say sympathy with <laughs> that. C could I piggyback on that slightly? I mean, I thought you were going to say of the pioneer woman in Tocqueville, that she endured all of this um, because of her children. And what you see, what you see in this story is the crucial difference of a house with children and a house without children. Uh, that sacrifice in the house of Minnie Foster is not for the sake of the future. Um, and uh, so it's really starker. It's very stark. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the frontier without that for which the frontier has been has been 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 settled. But, but, but there's, there's also something else. We set this out on the frontier or the Great Plains. It also partakes of a certain um, American sense of doing justice outside the law. Um, the sheriff is not always in town. Um, the procedures are not always available. The Westerns. The, 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 you know, the, 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 the Westerns. And um, there's a lot of vigilante justice during this particular time, not uh, necessarily salutary. But there is, there, there's something both um, good and bad about the American impulse to make things right and not to rely upon old and established and traditional institutions. Um, they take, they step forward, they try to fix things, they try to make things right. Um, and the law is, is in a way supposed to do this for us, but we don't surrender altogether our sense of our own rectitude or what we think uh, is, is needed, uh, both for better and for worse. Diana, you wanna, you wanna add it? You don't like that. <laughs> Well, uh, this this uh, reading is paired with two other readings. Exactly. Uh, one from Lincoln, uh, and Lincoln makes the case for absolute law-abidingness, right. and that this will be crucial, especially in the future, uh, to the to the preservation of self-government. So you're right that this other element is there very from American. an early point. Yes, and is very American. But Lincoln, at least, regards it as something that needs to be uh, needs to be corrected. Uh, but of course, the other reading, sandwiched between the Lincoln and the Glass Bowl is Martin Luther King's uh, letter from Birmingham jail, which says um, there are laws that aren't, that aren't laws because they're unjust. Right. So, I mean, I, I really do think with the, the, the array of these three pieces uh, that students can really see all of the arguments and reach their own conclusions. Good, fine. Diana, Leon, Amy, thank you for a fascinating uh, discussion.